Good morning. I am Will Smith. CC Shiloh and I welcome you to New Philadelphia Moravian Church on this third Sunday of Advent. Thank you, Will and Cece and Shiloh. The words that we are about to sing were written by Brother Daniel Cruz, and he has given us permission to use them today. The tune was written back in 1544 by the same man who wrote the words to Once He Came in Blessing. And as we sing these words, think about how the Christmas story is part of a story that continues all throughout the year. Good morning, and here is the news of the church for this Sunday, December 14th. We begin with congratulating Pam and Richard Williams on their anniversary. Um, these beautiful flowers were given in honor of that event, and apparently that's a surprise to the Williams, so congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you. Now, for a 12 days of service recap. Last Sunday's tree lighting was a lot of fun with a huge crowd here coming to hear the band and watch Ethel Butcher light the tree. Another aspect of the event was our coin collection for Samaritan Ministries. If you are not sitting down, you may want to now because I'm going to give you a number, really, you might want to sit down, um, because I'm going to give you a number that will, um, it is just, it left us all breathless. First, let me just say thank you to Tim Reynolds and Jerry Bumgardner who hauled those coins around and helped get everything counted. 
Now there was $33 in bills. There was $105.50 in rolled coins, and those two combined surpassed last year's total that we collected. But in loose change, $1,044.76. Isn't that phenomenal? It's really, really great. Um, the candle was really, really full. Thank you, Tiffany Henshaw. And we had to use every, um, every bucket we could find to collect all those coins. So that was very, very exciting and what a huge day that was. Now, the soup drive. To date, we are at um, just over 800 cans of soup. That's almost 200 short of our goal, but I have heard from some of you who haven't had time to get your soup and crackers in, so I think we're gonna stick that rolling cart out for two more days, Monday and Tuesday, um, under the portico. If you still have soup in the trunks of your car, drive them on over. I think we can reach that 1,000 cans um, of soup. You may have seen a picture of our TP tree during the announcements, and I'm thrilled to tell you that we have surpassed our goal of 2,000 rolls, and we now can tell you that 2,092 rolls of toilet paper were donated. That's good news for David Holston, the Executive Director of Sunnyside Ministry, who will bring our mission moment this morning. David, we will be delivering that toilet paper to you shortly, but we didn't want you to leave today without some merchandise. And so, in the back of my car, there are 40 bags of rice, 40 boxes of pasta, 40 packs of instant potatoes, 40 cans of vegetables, five cans of pasta sauce, and that's because the cart was full and I couldn't push it anymore, but we will deliver those to you when we take the toilet paper over. So that will be a total of 200 food items. On Thursday night, three of us went down to Samaritan Ministries to serve the meal that the church provided. And of course, that's always a really, um, it's a worthwhile project, but it's always very heartwarming. And if you wanna hear a great sound, it's the sound of chairs scraping against a linoleum floor when seconds are called, and we have enough for seconds. So, so thanks to the church for that generous donation of um, a big meal for Samaritan Ministries. Yesterday, we had a wonderful time with our, for our second Saturday in a row of caroling and taking a portable love feast um, to the homes of Marilyn and Bill Wood, Donna Chadwick, Eben Allspa, and Johnny Hooser. It was a wonderful way to spend time with these church members even though there was distance involved. But I think we all experienced something really, really special when uh, Morning Star was changed up a bit and Johnny and Jane sang the part that's usually reserved for a child, and the rest of us were the responders. And boy, that's something we're gonna remember, right, for a long time. And now looking ahead, we have a little sabbatical from 12 days of service projects until the 23rd of December. And I'll talk about it more next week, but if you have time late in the day on the 23rd, we're going to be um, doing some preparing for distributing Love Feast elements the following morning. Again, more details to follow. And then looking into the new year, as you're buying and receiving gifts and cleaning out closets, hang on to children's coats. We'll be collecting them for South Fork in January, just as we did last year. Thanks to Marla Sparks, who has um, agreed to provide leadership for this project. Last year, we donated 77 used and new coats. We certainly want to reach that number again this year. And now, David Holston. I want to begin by thanking you for this invitation to speak this morning, especially in this season. It's always a great time. So 2020 was a year or two different years at Sunnyside Ministry, it seems. Two distinctly different periods. We began 2020 with a great deal of optimism. Since late fall of last year, we had seen a decrease, slight, about 2% a month for the last four months previous um, from November through February. This was wonderful news and we were getting ready to share that with people. And then in um, March happened. In January and February, we saw the largest increase 
in membership in our gaining control classes. This is our future at Sunnyside, education and empowerment. And then, in, then we saw March happen. On Saturday, March 14th, I sat in my office and rewrote our complete procedures for distributing food and financial assistance and made the difficult decision to close our clothing center for a couple of months. Actually, we just opened this past week to great um, anticipation from the community. We also made the decision to suspend our gaining control classes for a few weeks until we could figure out how to move those online. On Monday, March 16th, we put the plan into operation. And with God's help, we have remained open the entire time throughout this pandemic, and we have never been without food or financial assistance for our, um, our neighbors. The most difficult yet the most responsible decision we made was to ask volunteers to remain at home and to remain safe. This has strained us at times. You may not know, but Sunnyside Ministry is one of the largest assistance agencies in Forsyth County, but yet we had the smallest staff, not by two or three, but we are five times smaller by, than the other agencies. Yet this year we have provided food 26,000 times. More than 575,000 pounds of food have been distributed this year throughout, through our drive-through, mainly through our drive-through food distribution system. The biggest year in our history was 411,000 pounds of food. This year we anticipate ending the year 50% above that year. Our neighbors need your help. We provide food and household items like toothpaste and toilet tissue to those in need. I saw the toilet tissue you've collected so far this year. I can tell you this is a needed item. I have yet to figure out how you can live with dignity and not have toilet tissue in your home. We are optimistic about a vaccine. We are optimistic about the resumption of more normal activities. What does concern us is the long-term effects of this pandemic. It took our clients nearly 10 years to recover after the last economic collapse in 2008 and 2009. It's a slow recovery process for those in poverty. But the reality is that people will be affected by this economic collapse probably well into the late 2020s, 2017 or even 2030. I want to leave you with a final thought. We all know the story of the loaves and fishes and how Jesus fed the 5,000. Recently, while looking at these passages from the four Gospels, there was one interesting and common phrase that jumped out at me. When the disciples asked about food for the crowd and how to feed them in Matthew, Luke, and Mark, Jesus says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. This made me rethink this story. Jesus performed a miracle but disciples helped in the work. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus will feed the multitude if we are willing to do our part in making that happen. We all need to do our part, small and large, to feed our neighbors, and God will make the miracles multiply. Thank you, and on behalf of Sunnyside Ministry, we hope you all have a Merry Christmas. Thank you again. Thank you, David. I had not planned to say this, but I have to say that right before the service when I was talking with David, he said that along with his comments about Sunnyside, he was going to use one um, scripture reference and, and, and make a theological reference. And he said, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong in my theology. He made the point about the feeding of the 5,000 and that Jesus said, you feed them. One of my first sermons here at New Philadelphia was from that passage, and I spoke to that theologically, but I'm so glad that today you've proved that that's not just a theological point, that's something that really happens in real life. And we thank you for your ministry. As the worship team leads us in prayer, Please remember the concerns, remember Sunnyside Ministries, and keep in your prayers and in your hearts, especially today, the New Hope and King of Kings congregations. In Miami, Florida, their pastor, my friend, 
and brother in Christ, Gregorio Moody, passed away early on this past Thursday morning. And please keep the congregations that he served and his family in prayer. Please keep um, Sally Sloan also in, in prayer. She suffered a fall and, and broke her shoulder. Let's pray. that we can continue to glorify God's name and support some of the ministries that have been mentioned here this morning and beyond by sending our offerings and our, our tithes, either if you are here in one of the plates, if you so desire, or by mailing them to New Philadelphia at 4440 Country Club Road, or on the secure giving portals that are on our website. For our offertory prayer, once again, I read from the prayer in our daily text today. Creator God, we worship and adore you, for there is no end to your creative powers. You create life anew within us and inspire us to live lives of service by sending your Son to redeem us and show us the way. Use our gifts, O oh God, to serve you and to spread your light throughout all the world. Amen. Jesus is the light of the world, he is the light of the world, he is the light of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is the light of the world, and we will follow him. Jesus is the light of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is the light of 
the world, he is the light of the world, he is the light of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is the light of the world, and we will follow him. Jesus is the light of the world. upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. <clears throat> they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations.
gospel lesson this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. So during Advent, we've been talking about what we need to do to be ready when Jesus comes, because that's what Advent is all about. It's a time of preparation for Jesus coming, coming as a baby in the manger, and for Jesus when he comes back for us at the end of our earthly days. We've talked about two things that we need to be. We need to be emptied of all the stuff that doesn't please him, looking inside ourselves to see what we need to change, what we need to move out, what we need to wash away to make room for the baby Jesus to move in. Last week, we talked about being eager to welcome him, waiting expectantly, even impatiently, for him to come to us. Remember the volcano in the jungle and the rescue helicopter? We want to be waiting expectantly for Jesus with that same eagerness. So what else do we need to be to welcome the baby Jesus into our hearts and lives this Christmas season? This week's word is sanctified. It means set apart for a purpose, to be holy. In the scripture I just read, it says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, why on earth do I have a Christmas tree stand this morning? How many requirements are there for a Christmas tree stand? Does it need to look beautiful? Because this one's a little crooked and beat up and it even has duct tape on it. Does it need to be versatile enough? Versatile enough to hold a candle or my cell phone? No. This Christmas tree holder just has one job. It's set aside for one purpose, and that one purpose makes it special. We couldn't have a beautiful, festive Christmas tree to decorate in our home and make it feel like Christmas without a Christmas tree holder. It's set aside for one purpose all year, and that one purpose makes it a special, irreplaceable thing to have in our home. And that's how God sees us, special, irreplaceable, and that's how he wants us to see ourselves. When we serve him and when we prepare for Jesus' coming, he wants us to know that we are special and irreplaceable. We are sanctified, set apart for a purpose, and our purpose is to love and serve our Savior. We don't have to look beautiful. We don't have to be good at everything we try. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be set apart for our purpose, to love and serve our Savior. So during this Advent season, let's wait patiently and prepare ourselves, emptying ourselves of the things that don't reflect Jesus, waiting eagerly for his coming into our hearts and lives, and committing to be sanctified, set aside for our own special purpose, loving and serving our Savior.
Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you, and we want to be found waiting eagerly for your arrival in our hearts, emptied of the things that don't come from you, and sanctified for your service. Help us to use this time to make our hearts ready to grow ever closer to you. Amen. The good news this morning comes from John's account of the gospel in the first chapter. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Last week, I started the sermon, or the message, by saying, here we are again. 
And the here, where we were again, was in the wilderness on the other side of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. And people from Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to the wilderness to repent and be baptized and then come back over Jordan into the promised land just as their ancestors had done many years ago. But now they could try it again, have a fresh start, a new direction, follow a better path. And if last week began with, here we are again, this week it's, here he is again. And the he that I'm referring to is that man named John. Last Sunday, we read about John in Mark, and this Sunday, we read about John in John. I know, it's confusing. But the Gospel of John, that is often attributed to John the Apostle, the disciple whom Jesus loved, starts with this story of a man named John, another one, that we sometimes call John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, or the Voice, the Messenger, and remember I call him the Strange Angel. But today in John's Gospel, he's referred to as a witness, someone who testifies. He was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Now, when I hear those words, witness and testify, it brings to mind the, the image of a courtroom. When a witness is called to the stand, that person has to answer questions and testify to the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And in our reading in John's Gospel this morning, the wilderness seems to be transformed into a courtroom or an interrogation chamber because the Pharisees sent the priests and the Levites out into the wilderness to question John, to question this witness and make him testify, to record his testimony. And the first thing that they did was ask him to identify himself. They said, who are you? But instead of telling them who he was, John told them who he wasn't. He said, I am not the Messiah. But they had some follow-up questions for the witness. They asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So again, they asked him, who are you? What do you say about yourself? And see, there's the problem. Witnesses aren't usually there to talk about themselves. They testify or bear witness to or talk about something else or someone else. John didn't want to tell them about John. He wanted to tell them about Jesus. He wanted to tell them about the light of the world. And they must have been surprised when he said that that light was right there with them they just hadn't seen it yet. They hadn't seen the light. Because John said, among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. He's right there among you, but you don't know it. Sometimes the light can be right in our midst and we just don't know it. We don't see it. We need someone to, to point it out, to be a witness, to testify to the light. I'm reminded of Jacob's journey in the wilderness way back in the book of Genesis. He had been walking all day, and he came to a certain place, and the sun had set, so the story says that he took a stone and put it under his head and went to sleep. Doesn't sound like the best pillow, but pretty boring story. He was evening, so he just decided to lie down and go to sleep. Nothing to write home about, as we say. But then he had a dream. And there was a stairway or a ladder, Jacob's ladder, and angels going up and down. And there was God, and he heard God's voice. And when he woke up, he looked around and said, Surely God is in this place, and I didn't know it. But now he did know it. So he had a story to tell. He had a testimony to share. 
He was a witness to God's presence, and now he could testify, tell others about what he had seen and experienced so that they could know, and then they could share the story with others, and they too would know, they too would see the light. And the story of that journey, Jacob's journey, reminded me of another young man's journey, a much younger version of your pastor, Way back in 1974, 46 years ago, I was entering my junior year at Moravian College in Bethlehem, and I started thinking, how can I spend the fall and winter semester in the tropics instead of in Pennsylvania? How can I live in villages on a Caribbean coast with warm sea breezes even in December and January and sleep in a hammock but do something worthwhile and constructive and get college credit for it and grade myself? Well, the answer was two words, field study. And I was able to present a plan that got approved by a professor of linguistics in the English department. You see, in the Miskito region of Honduras, especially at that time, there were lots of older people who had never had the opportunity to go to school because there were very few schools when when they were growing up, and they had never learned how to read. And most of them really wanted to learn. So the plan was to offer adult literacy classes. We identified four villages with the um, best beaches, I mean with the highest illiteracy rate, and I spent two and a half weeks in each of the four villages offering classes every afternoon. One of the villages was called Raya. But I had a good friend, a pastor, who lived in another village about three miles down the beach. And so I stayed with him at his house. And every morning I would walk the beach to Raya and then have my classes all afternoon and walk back home before sunset just in time for supper. It was a college student's dream. Well, one day we had a church service in the evening after class, and it was about 8.30 at night when I was ready to walk back to the village where I was staying. But they told me, you can't walk back on the beach. The tide is in, and when the tide is in, there's a natural pool that is really deep, and you can't walk across it. But there's another path back to where you're going. It goes through the bush, the jungle. Now, they had walked that path many times, but I had not. And it was dark. And I mean really dark. No moon, no stars that night, cloudy, can't see your hand right in front of your face, dark. And I had to feel my way along the path. And there were thick bushes on each side of the path. And when I would bump into them, then I knew that I was going astray and I could correct my path. I did eventually make it back home, but it took a lot longer than usual. And I was pretty miserable. Well, I went into my room and took off my backpack and threw it on the floor. And I heard a loud thud. And that seemed odd because... In my backpack, I had a change of clothing and some paper and and notebooks, but this thud sounded different. I I reached down and and opened the backpack and took out a t-shirt and some shorts and my notepad and my flashlight. And yes, I felt very silly. I had been groping around in the dark, veiled in darkness, and with the light literally tapping me on my shoulder. What is that in my backpack? It was with me, but I didn't know it. It could have enlightened me. It could have been a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As someone has said, that'll preach. But when my field study came to an end and I went back to Moravian College, I was asked to speak in chapel one morning. And I decided to share that story about walking in the darkness and not taking advantage of the light that I had. There were 
three students present in chapel that morning. They at the college later figured out that morning was not a good time to have chapel for college students. But yes, I told that story about walking in the dark with the light to three people. Well, fast forward about 35 years to when a friend of mine attended midnight mass on Christmas Eve at a Catholic church in Pennsylvania. And he told me that the priest at that midnight mass on Christmas Eve shared a story that he had heard in chapel when he was a student at Moravian College many years ago. One of his fellow students told this story about walking in the dark in Honduras and having a flashlight in his backpack but not knowing that it was there. And the priest challenged his parishioners to look for the light in their midst and then share that light with others. You see, a witness is someone who sees something that others may not have seen and then tells people about it and you never know what might happen. Clyde saw some amazing things that God was doing this past week through many of you right here in our midst, and you may not have known, but she was a witness and she shared the story with you, and now you know, you've seen the light. Brother David was a witness to what God is doing through Sunnyside Ministries, and he shared that testimony, and now we know, and we can share it with others. You see, that light that enlightens everyone has come into the world. It is among us, and if we know it, if we see it, we need to share it with those who don't know. Where have you seen the light of Christ lately? Don't keep me in the dark. Tell me about it. And that's not just a line in my sermon. No, I, I really mean it. Tell me about it. Take a moment sometime today, or as soon as you can, to think about some way that you have seen Christ's light in the darkness around you. And then send me an email, sam at newphilly.org, not rocket science, sam at newphilly.org. Or leave me a message on the phone, 336-765-2331. Or mail me a letter at 4440 Country Club Road, or even a comment on Facebook, so that I can see the light that you've seen. And then, not 35 years from now, but next week, next Sunday, I'll share those glimpses of light with all of you and others who are, are here or, or watching or listening, so that they too can see and hear what you have witnessed. I'm depending on you for my sermon next Sunday. And your testimonies will help me prove my case, my allegation, that the light, the true light that enlightens everyone, has come into the world and continues to shine in the darkness. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you truly are the light of the world. We thank you for people that you have sanctified and set apart in many different places, but for a purpose of glorifying you and seeing that light and being that light. We thank you that since we are set apart, we can see how your light shines in so many different places. Help us to bear witness to that light to testify to what you are doing and to share those stories that others might know and hear, that others might see the light. We thank you for being the light in our world. In Jesus' name, amen.
continue the custom of raising a hand to ask God's blessing on, on us and on our congregation. I raise another hand this morning specifically to ask God's blessing on Sunnyside Ministries and Brother David and his ministry there. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship and, and the light of God's Spirit be with us all in Jesus' name.